It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Palaisuji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Aloha and good morning. Thanks for tuning in here to Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and we're live this morning on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Uh, you know, we began this conversation, <laughs> hard to believe, three years ago. <laughs> the show was actually called The COVID Care Conversation as we focus uh, a lot of our discussions on the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, it was uh, a time where there were a lot of questions out there in the community as to what was happening and how we were going to combat this. Uh, and the, our guest this morning has become a voice that we've enjoyed speaking to <laughs> over these past few years regarding COVID-19. Absolutely. We, of course, are talking about Dr. Tim Brown from the East West Center. Uh, he's really been our guiding light when it comes to trying to figure out what uh, we should do when it comes to our own protection and also taking an international and world view of the, the virus itself. So we welcome in Dr. Tim Brown from the East West Center. Dr. Brown, thanks so much for being here this morning. Oh, great to be here. So broad strokes, we always like to ask you, uh, how are we doing right now? Uh, you know, I think a lot of people kind of have a feeling that is COVID and, and even I myself, you know, is COVID still something that I need to be worried about and to what degree? And, and so, so to that end, uh, how are we doing? Okay. Uh, before I go into that, let me start by giving a big thank you to the uh, Hawaii Department of Health. Uh, while data systems are being dismantled around the country. I think they're doing a great job basically of keeping our data online here in Hawaii. And their COVID uh, dashboards are still being updated. We're still getting the once a week data, but we can break that down by day so we can actually see the trends and know what's going on. So I think they're doing a great job and I really just wanted to send a shout out to them first. Uh, okay, let's, let's go into the first slide then. As far as COVID goes, we've been in a pretty steady state for the last six, seven weeks. And this is updated with the data that came out today. Uh, so you can see our cases since about mid-May have been pretty stable at about 50 cases per day. There was that blip before that, which was basically the uh, spring break blip that we talked about, I think, in my last spotlight appearance, uh, where cases suddenly shot up and I had to redo all my slides at the last minute because things changed totally that day. Uh, but now we're back into a steady state. Uh, cases staying stable. Next slide. Uh, test positivity on Oahu hovering around 10%. It's fluctuating up and down, but staying in that general range. Uh, that fluctuation we expect because our number of tests is down. It's only about 350 tests per day being done now. Uh, so some statistical fluctuation is pretty normal there. Next slide. In terms of hospitalizations, uh, we're looking pretty good. Uh, the numbers are staying fairly stable. This is hospital admissions that we now get from CDC. We primarily get most of our data from CDC now because HAH has stopped reporting out COVID numbers on their website. Uh, Department of Health still puts some out there, but CDC is actually tracking these trends. The only problem with CDC is they're about two weeks out of date. So this data only runs through uh, June 17th. But nonetheless, you can see this is hospital admissions who are testing positive for COVID. You can see again in the last several months, the numbers have been pretty stable at about 13 admissions per day. So hospitalizations are stable. Uh, the one thing that is showing some worrying signs right now, next slide, is wastewater. Uh, this is the wastewater that I get from the BioBot site, which is the most up-to-date site. This is data through the end of June. Uh, and you can see the Big Island showed a sudden massive shoot up there. And I haven't really seen that reflected in cases yet, but I think we need to watch that over the near future. Similarly, Honolulu has shown a significant increase in the last week or so. Again, I'm not sure what's causing this. If I look at the CDC that site, it's interesting because we're seeing more cases in the wastewater plants on the North Shore. Uh, so there may be something going on up there that's not affecting Honolulu proper. But again, we'll, we'll see how that plays out over the next uh, couple of weeks. 
and just so for basically clar- stable. Yeah, for, for some clarification of that, when you're looking at the statistics of the wastewater, and we see that jump, but then we also look at some of the test numbers that are down. Do you, do you think that's just a direct result of the fact that many people may be having symptoms, maybe feeling sick, and just aren't testing specifically for COVID-19 while it may be out there? Oh, I think there, there's absolutely no question that our testing is down. If we actually look at the testing numbers, there's a very steady decline over time where they're just going, you know, we're down, we're doing about a quarter of the tests now that we were doing last August on a daily basis. And that, that still is trending downward. So part of the reason why we're seeing this higher positivity now, we saw about 5% toward the end of last year. Now we're seeing about 10%. My guess as to what's happening there is that we're dealing probably with a concentration effect. As a number of tests go down, the number of people who are coming in for testing are the sicker people, right? Because they're the ones who feel, oh, well, yeah, I've got really bad symptoms. And so they come in to get a COVID test. And therefore, because more sicker people are testing, the population that is getting tested is sicker. We're tending to get a concentration, a higher level of COVID tests coming in. But if we did a cross-sectional sample, my guess is we, you know, across the entire population, we'd probably see a pretty constant level of COVID over most of that period, except for the holiday blips and the spring break blip. We'd see some other blips then. Well, given what you laid out, especially in terms of hospitalizations, let's talk about the disease that we're now facing. You know, we have, you said that things are pretty much stable. Has the severity of the disease changed? Have the outcomes changed? What do you, what, you know, how concerned should we be if we do test positive for COVID? Well, again, I think that question has an answer, has two different answers. The first answer, if you're young, you don't have underlying conditions and you test positive for COVID, rest up. Uh, Absolutely, rest is absolutely essential to recovering from COVID. Don't try to power through it. This is not one you want to power through. If you power through it, you're probably going to increase your chances of long COVID, for example. And for those younger people or those without underlying conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera, probably what they have to worry about is long COVID. And that still affects about 10% of all people who get the Omicron variants. So long COVID is nothing to ignore. It can be a significant thing, and it's a good reason to avoid getting infected. Uh, For those who are in the older population or who do have underlying conditions like immunocompromised, cardiovascular disease, obesity is a big one. When you test positive, if you're above age 50, you should definitely be getting on Paxlovid. Even if you're below age 50 and you have one of those conditions, you should still get on Paxlovid. Paxlovid has been shown to be about 30% effective on people in the even in the 18 to uh, 50 age range who have any of those underlying conditions. So it will reduce your chances basically both of severe illness and hospitalization, but it will also reduce your chances of contracting long COVID. Okay, so people in underlying conditions or older still need to treat a COVID infection seriously. And that means they've got to have quick access to testing, which means if, if you're in one of those categories, keep a bunch of home test kits around. Okay, uh, You need access to Paxlovid. My recommendation would be talk to your provider beforehand. If I test positive, how can I get Paxlovid quickly? That's what I've done with my doctor. Okay, And she's agreed, okay, if you show up with a positive home test, you know, obviously with a repeat or something just to verify it's there, she would prescribe Paxlovid for me based on that. Okay. Because if you have to get a PCR, that's going to add another couple of days. And remember with Paxlovid, it's important to get that treatment quickly. You need to get it within five days of developing symptoms for it to be most effective. And for people in those older categories, the effectiveness is substantially higher. If you're not vaccinated, it reduces illness by almost 80%. Uh, if you are vaccinated, it's still reducing it in the 35 to 40 percent range if you're in those older age categories. <clears throat> so it is important that you get tested and get Paxlovid if you're in any of those categories that have higher risk for severe illness and hospitalization. Uh, you know, one of the things that we also uh, like to talk about with you, uh, and a word that we've used many times in this, is variant. Uh, what are some of the other variants, or is there anything out there that you're keeping an eye on that may be concerning to you uh, about what we're seeing in the mutation of this disease? Yeah, let's go to the next slide. 
<clears throat> what I've done here is I pulled up the current variants that are really dominant in Hawaii in the upper left, across the U.S. in the upper right, and globally on the lower graph. And you can see there's not that much variation in the picture. Uh, we're coming up a little more slowly than the globe in terms of uh, XBB 1.5 getting pushed out. Okay, you'll see at the global level that blue slice, the XBB 1.5 slice, is getting smaller and smaller. That's because these other variants are more transmissible. So they're really pushing the XBB 1.5 off the map. And in the US, it's not as far along as we are globally. That global number is largely influenced by India, which had a huge XBB 116 outbreak that dominant, and India has such a large population as a huge impact. Uh, but we're seeing the same things. 95% of all the sequences that are being done globally now are XBB. And that's pretty much the same here in Hawaii. We've got a little bit of other things left, but mostly it's this XBB family. Now, so far, there's no evidence whatsoever that any of these variants have more severity than the original Wuhan strain. Okay, and that's an important point. Uh, they're not like Delta. Delta caused a lot more severe illness. Delta was probably four times as, as deadly, if you will, as the original Wuhan strain. But that doesn't mean we can sneeze at that. Remember, think back to what March and April of 2020 looked like and what New York City looked like in that summer. That was with the original Wuhan strain. There's actually a paper that came out last week where they compared the Wuhan strain to the Omicron. And in the absence of vaccination, they have about the same lethality. Okay. So fundamentally, Omicron is still dangerous. What's protecting us is that most of us have either had multiple vaccines or we've had previous infections. And both of those give us protection. CDC has recently ran a survey through December of uh, 2022. And 96.7% of the US population had protection, either had antibodies either from vaccine or from previous infections. And so fundamentally, that's what's protecting us at this point, because while we will lose antibodies over time, our T cell protections tend to stay fairly strong for a much longer period. They still need to be boosted, which is why getting a, an additional vaccine shot can help to strengthen your T cells and reduce hospitalizations for those who are in the older categories or the high risk categories. But the T cell protection itself is holding up pretty well for most people. And that's why they seem to be getting less severe. Okay, the reality is they're still as severe as what caused all the damage in 2020. But what's, what's changed is that our immunity has gotten better. And so as a, as a species across the globe, given that there probably been they estimate, you know, somewhere on the order of six and a half to seven million people infected globally, which is most of the world's population. Uh, that's what's giving us our protection at this point. Well, on the subject of vaccines, we have two questions from viewers that, that follow up on that. The first one from Heidi. Is there any update information on the new vaccinations for the fall? Will it incorporate the flu vaccine as well? And related to that, Grant Phillips wants to know, is another triple demic possible for this fall? Uh, he's including the flu, COVID, and RSV and asking, will the new RSV vaccines be available in Hawaii this year? So for Heidi and for Grant, what's the latest on vaccines? Okay, very good questions. Uh, in terms of the vaccine, the COVID vaccine for the fall, uh, the FDA committee met last month. Uh, they have decided on an XBB based vaccine because just as I showed you in the previous variant chart, XBB is pretty much the only game in town. It's 95% of all the cases globally. So it's, it's going to be really well targeted in that regard. Uh, it will be a monovalent. They're not going to give you some of the old, old vaccine along with some of the new vaccine. They're just going to give you a monovalent. That is, it will be a vaccine against XBB only. And the reason for that is what we found with the bivalent was that it did not give us as strong an immune response against the early Omicron variant because of what's called imprinting. Okay, imprinting is where your immune system reacts more strongly to something that's been exposed to before and reacts more weakly to slight changes in that. And so what we got, we got really strong responses to the original Wuhan strain, but that wasn't circulating anymore. Okay, and we got a less strong response 
to the Omicron strain, although now that people, most people probably had an Omicron infection at this point, uh, they're, they're going to have good protection against Omicron and probably against XBB at this point as well, although they should definitely get boosted because that, that protection always wanes over time. And so they've decided to go with a monovalent instead of the bivalent this fall. Uh, the final recommendations on that will be made by CDC in October, probably. Uh, normally, that's when the ACIP, the CDC committee that handles these things, will meet. And they will almost certainly settle on an XBB. Probably the FDA was leaning toward XBB 1.5. Some people say XBB 116. But there's only a couple of mutation differences between those. So it probably will make very little difference which XBB variant they use in the vaccines. On the RSV vaccine, that has now received approval for people who are age 60 and older. Uh, and, but it's, it wasn't phrased as a recommendation. It was phrased as it will be available to you if you want it in consultation with your doctor. Okay. They, I think they felt that the vaccine was new enough at this point that they didn't want to recommend it for everybody, but people who are concerned about RSV should be able to get that vaccine this fall. I would assume it will be available in Hawaii just as other vaccines are. There's no right reason why it shouldn't be. And finally, flu vaccines. Uh, absolutely, you should be getting your flu vaccine this fall. Uh, again, as to whether they will put the COVID vaccine together with the flu vaccine, I haven't heard much recently on that. Some were talking about that, and I'm not sure whether any of the manufacturers are going to go along with that at this point or not. But if not, then they'll do like they did last year. They'll give you two jabs at the same time, although you can separate those if you want to. But be sure to get the flu vaccine as well as the <clears throat> COVID vaccine. And if you are worried about RSV, which does kill about 10,000 elderly people in the U.S. every year, it's probably not a bad idea to get the RSV vaccine as well. When we're talking about vaccines, have we learned anything new about uh, the efficacy, just the overall success rate? I mean, you know, when this first happened, there were a, a bunch of different brands, uh, of course, that people had maybe a preference for one over the other. Have we learned anything about uh, if there is one brand that has had a higher success rate uh, or just anything that we've learned about the vaccines uh, since this time? Well, I think still fundamentally the mRNA vaccines are considered to be the gold standard. Uh, <clears throat> Novavax, I think, has actually dropped off even in the United States because there simply wasn't enough demand for it. So I actually think their authorization was pulled basically because they requested it be pulled since they didn't want to continue providing it within the United States. So usually the mRNA vaccines are considered the gold standard across the world. Uh, the good thing about mRNAs is they can be changed very quickly. I mean, literally, in, you know, inside a couple of weeks, they can basically change the sequence that's in there and start manufacturing new vaccine. In terms of those vaccines, it's pretty much the same picture we've been seeing for the last year or so. Uh, you get good protection for typically two to three months after the vaccination. Some protection against infection, probably on the order of 50, 60% protection against infection. But then that drops off fairly quickly after that. So by six months, you're not having much protection against infection you will still have some protection against hospitalization and death. Okay, so th there's two different impacts there. One is protection against infection. The other is protection against severe illness and death. And severe illness and death, lasts, that protection lasts longer. And that's why for older people, you know, now we're recommending probably every six months if they want to get it. So that's, you know, kind of where it stands right now. But it does wane, so you do have to get those boosted up from time to time. You know, when vaccines were first being rolled out, one of the things that we were really told by public health officials was that everyone needed to take a vaccine because without that, of course, more variants can uh, can occur. Uh, I'm wondering about, you know, what the expectation will be for uptake here in the United States. Uh, and then more broadly, globally, one of the concerns was that, hey, even if we all get it here in Hawaii or in the United States as, at large, uh, if all of a certain country or continent doesn't have the similar access, that these variants will continue to, you know, multiply and will continue to be exposed to dangers that way. So what do you, what, what is the picture of vaccine distribution, both here, you know, Hawaii, the U.S., but then also that global question? Well, I think, you know, in terms of the U.S., if I look at the bivalent 
or I look at anybody who's been boosted in Hawaii in the last year, in both cases, I'm talking about numbers on the order of 22%. So the uptake has actually been pretty poor. Most of the population has not had any booster within the last 12 months and certainly not the bivalent booster. And so that means that their protection against infection is waning. Now they've still got that T cell protection, which is much longer lasting. And that's what's keeping them from getting severely ill. But they're probably, unfortunately, getting boosted by repeat COVID infections as well. You know, and I'm sorry, but, you know, if you're one of those people who wants to brag about how you've had COVID three or four times, frankly, I think you're crazy. Because every time you take that chance, you're, rush, you're rolling the dice again on getting long COVID or getting more severe illness. So I really would not recommend getting repeated COVID infections if you can't. So I think that, you know, fundamentally, the global picture is not that much different than the U.S. since we're only at about 20 percent with the bivalent. Uh, I haven't looked at the global numbers recently, but they're probably as low or lower than that, just because the vaccine is not as readily available in other countries as it is here. You know, places like Singapore have, you know, 95 percent vaccination rates among their elderly and things like this. But we are not Singapore, unfortunately. And even here in Hawaii, un among the elderly, I think our current rate is only about uh, I think it's just it's like 45 percent for those who are in the 65 to 75 age range. And then 75 and older, it goes up to about 63 percent. So there's still about half of our kapuna who have not received the bivalent vaccine. And they really should be getting that bivalent vaccine because it will greatly reduce for them their chance of hospitalization and death. You know, you mentioned that the risk of long COVID, and I'm wondering if we can just spend some time talking a little bit about what we're learning about that effects. I mean, it has been some time for some people who have been suffering through this. Is there anything new that we are learning about treatments for long COVID or just the overall impacts that it's having uh, on populations of people? Yeah, well, let's look at long COVID itself first. Uh, there is a recent study, the first major report that came out of what's called the Recover, in Recover Initiative which is a National Institutes of Health study of long COVID. And they published a paper in Journal of American Medical Association in May that gave the first set of information. They're following about 10,000 people. And of that, about 2,000 of those people, 2,200, have Omicron infections where they know the time of infection. Okay, They were infected either during the study or they're infected at, pretty much at the time of enrollment, within 30 days of the enrollment in the study. What we're finding for those 2,200 people who enrolled at that time, at six months, 224 of them still have long COVID. That is, they have symptoms of COVID that are still pretty serious. Okay. And that is 10%. And that's across all ages, across different ranges and so on. It's, it's not a random sample, but it's the best data we have at this point. Omicron will produce long COVID at about a 10% rate in the population. Now, it will vary in severity from person to person. Some people may only have one or two symptoms. Some people will be totally floored by it and not be able to do anything. And recovery is still slow. Of those who were showing long COVID at six months, by nine months, which is as far as the study has gotten so far, only one third of those people had recovered. Okay. And this is actually keeping with what we've seen in previous long COVID studies that looked at long COVID with earlier variants. What we found there was about 20% of the people would develop long COVID. But at one year, only about 18% or sorry, only about 5% of those had recovered. So still 18% were showing long COVID symptoms. And after two years, 17.2% were still showing long COVID symptoms. So the problem is the symptoms of long COVID, fatigue, malaise, brain fog, loss of smell, uh, all of those can continue for long periods in many people, okay? And that's why I said that person who's out there bragging about his three or four COVID infections is really crazy because he is playing Russian roulette. Every time he gets another COVID wow. infection, he's taken, you know, another gamble that he won't develop long COVID after that. So I do think, you know, we need to take long COVID seriously. There are... A lot of people, I mean, currently across the United States, the CDC does what's called the Pulse Survey. And in that survey, currently 6% of Americans are reporting that they are currently suffering from long COVID. 
Wow, six percent. That I mean, when you think about and that's how large a, that's our country a cross-sectional is, survey. An, an incredible amount of people. I want to broaden it out a little bit. Uh, we had Paul Brubaker, economist Paul Brubaker, on our program uh, earlier this week, and he, uh, when he heard you were going to be on, posed a question for you. You know, he and and there's a great write-up of the uh, of our interview with him in today's Honolulu Star Advertiser, and you can of course catch that program again on uh, wherever you catch your podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I wanted to say that you know he was wondering the impacts because you can see a direct correlation, of course, between between uh, you know, spikes in variants and infection and declines in tourism. And so on the issue of long COVID, you know, his basic question is, uh, can the economy essentially catch a case of long COVID? And, and, and just curious about your thoughts on that. Okay, let, let's put up Paul's slide for a second. Okay, this is the slide that Paul showed on Monday. And you can see where we have the Omicron and Delta spikes, our tourism dropped significantly. No surprise there. A lot of people were sick, so they don't travel as much. But then if we compare the trend from before COVID, this is in terms of passengers arriving in uh, Hawaii, we've settled in at a level that is probably, what, 85 90% of what we were before COVID. And so I think Paul's question is, is this a real thing? You know, is, is this related to COVID in some way? And so, okay, you can pull the slide now. So let's... Let's talk about that. What could produce that reduction? Okay. Well, the first thing is what I just mentioned. Cross-sectionally, 6% of Americans at this point in time are reporting symptoms of long COVID. Those 6% of people probably are not going to be traveling, nor are their families going to be traveling. Right? If you don't feel well, it's not the time to go on a vacation and head to Hawaii. You know, that's not the brightest thing. So a lot of people probably aren't traveling because of illness. What other effects could COVID have? Well, there's a whole bunch of people in the United States, like me, who are not ready to just run out and jump on a plane without any precautions. Because we all know, I know many of my friends who've gone on international flights and come back with COVID. They pick it up on the plane. Planes, planes spread COVID like crazy. So apologies to the airline industry, but it's the reality. When we're not masking on planes, we are spreading COVID on planes. And there's very little question of that. And I'm, and a bunch of people like me are not ready to just jump on planes willy nilly. If I'm going to travel, it's only because I really have to. And then I will take every precaution, including masking on all flights and trying to avoid the crowded areas of the airport, et cetera, et cetera, because I recognize the danger associated with that. Uh, so a lot of those people aren't willing to travel extensively at this point or are restricting their travel somewhat. Uh, a lot of people think that, well, most people in the U.S. have already had COVID. That's not true. Okay. Three quarters of people in the U.S. have had a COVID infection. There's another quarter of people in the U.S. who have not had a COVID infection ever. Okay. They, they, you know, this, is, this comes from looking for indicators of COVID infection in the blood. And basically, they don't have those markers. They were, that quarter were never infected. And if we go to the older population, people above age 65, that's 43.5% of those of us above age 65 have never had COVID. We've had vaccines and we have protection from the vaccines, but we've never had COVID. So this claim that everybody has COVID is not true. And the reason that 43.5% of older people don't have COVID is they've been careful. And those people are probably going to continue being careful going forward. I certainly am. I still mask in public and so on. So that's another effect, people not wanting to travel. Uh, the other factors are, are economic. First, our international tourism has not recovered to anywhere near the level it was before COVID, and Japan is a big part of our tourism. I actually looked at the DBED numbers for tourism arrivals on, I think it was Saturday night, and our Hawaii, our Japan travelers were down by a factor of two from what they for, were before COVID. So that's affecting it. And then finally, the airlines themselves, I think, are a factor because they still haven't recovered fully from COVID. They're still understaffed. They're still canceling flights like crazy. And when you hear about all these flight cancellation, that probably reduces your likelihood of wanting to travel too much. So, yes, I'd say there are a whole lot of different effects that COVID could be having that are effectively producing a long COVID on the economy. 
So we're out of my time, answer but... to Paul's question is yes. <laughs> we're out of time, but Ryan, let's make sure we get Nina's question in here this morning. Yeah, we have uh, just one final question here about some of the things that are happening around town. And Nina's asking uh, who uh, writes for the Honolulu Star Advertiser, uh, saying that the lunch of Skyline uh, as Honolulu Road, which thousands rode over the last five days. Uh, do you think people should still wear masks on public transportation, uh, such as the rail? Uh, who should mask and how does it compare to the airplane or the bus? I personally think probably everybody should be masking on any public transit. Uh, if not to protect themselves, then to protect the Kapuna and the others with uh, higher risk conditions who are taking those public transports. Uh, the skyline, depending on how crowded it is, you're going to be stuffed in a small tube with a whole lot of people for a long period of time. Now, my understanding, actually, Nina told me her son was looking at the CO2 levels on mm -hmm. uh the skyline and basically found it was pretty good. It was about 400, which is pretty much like outside. So they've got good ventilation. But the problem is if you're packed in with a whole bunch of other people and are standing and you've got five or six people within two or three feet of you, you are basically breathing the air that those people are exhaling. Okay. So yes, there is still a chance that you can crack, contract it. In fact, there's a very interesting study that came out of an outbreak in a night market in China, which most people would think it's an outdoor setting. So there's probably not much. Well, there was an outbreak where three index cases affected 113 out of 5,000 people at that night market. Okay, so even outdoor settings, if you're close to people who do have COVID, especially with the Omicron variants that are so transmissible, yes, you can still get infected. So my short answer is absolutely mask if you're on public transit, Skyline, the bus or airlines. And we are out of time. So we thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, just in maybe 10, 20 seconds, bottom line, should people be concerned about this and, and advice going forward? I think absolutely you should be concerned. First, COVID continues to circulate at substantial levels in the population. The risk of long COVID is real, even for younger people. And you really don't want to get that if you can avoid it. There's still a significant risk of hospitalization death for the elderly, for our Kapuna. And, you know, we're, we're still losing Kapuna at an average rate of about seven per day or seven per week, rather, here in Hawaii. So we're still seeing a lot of deaths. And finally, the current variants are just incredibly easy to transmit. So even if you're outdoors in a market situation with a lot of people around you, there's still a good chance you can get enough of a dose of one of these new XBB variants basically to infect you. So, yes, absolutely. We should be treating it as if it's real. Infectious All right, Dr. disease. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Simbron, thank you so much for joining us uh, from the East West Center. We always appreciate having you on and all the insights that you provide uh, here in Spotlight Hawaii. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Aloha. Bye. Aloha. Great to hear from him. We are out of time, so we're going to wrap it up really quickly here. But Ryan, very interesting, uh, you know, the data that he shared. Basically, we're stable, but there's still quite a bit of COVID in our community. And th those long COVID risks are really, you know, what always sort of pique my interest because you think about just we've had Dr. Norm Chow here from the COVID clinic uh, over at Queens and the long COVID clinic and just hearing about the experience of patients there. You don't want to be part of that population. Uh, and it is about 10 percent of people who catch the virus, even if you've had it before. Uh, he really emphasized that if you are in a high risk category or over a certain age, that Paxlovid should be a conversation that you have now before you get infected with your doctor so that you know how you could get that treatment uh, in a timely manner if you are to get infected. Uh, and then on the vaccines, crazy to think that the uptake uh, of, the, of the booster has been so low, um, but he is saying that there is going to be likely um, a, a new vaccine coming out in the fall. I'm not sure yet if that will be paired with the flu shot or not. Yeah, it's always great to hear from Dr. Tim Brown and getting an update on everything that's happened as he continues to keep a pulse on all that's happening, not only here locally, but internationally as well. On Friday, we're going to be switching gears and going to be talking to the man who is uh, now tasked with taking over the Hawaii Athletics Program. Uh, Craig Angeles, the new athletic director, will be joining us. We're going to be talking to him about progress that's being made to the football uh, stadium on campus. We're going to be talking to him about his hopes and his perspectives going into this next athletic season uh, always going to be excited for me personally to talk about <laughs> sports on this show so looking forward to getting an update and learning more about the new man who is leading the hawaii athletics department we'll see you right back here on friday for another episode of spotlight hawaii aloha aloha